right, thank you for staying with us on Bottom Line Africa. So there have been reports that hundreds of people are being auctioned in modern day slave markets in Libya for as little as $400. And trust me, that report has sparked quite an outrage in the entire world. Um, we'll be having that conversation in a couple of minutes because I need to run part of that story for you that was done by CNN in a bit. But we'll be speaking to Ken Roth, he's executive director of Human Rights Watch. He's joining us from Geneva. We also have Ms. Simone Dege. She is the UN Refugee Agency spokesperson based here in Kenya. And we also have George Musse from Frog Fra Fragoman immigration um, so we'll be having a conversation with them in a couple of minutes but for now let's take a look at that story that now sets the basis for this conversation on november 17 cnn broadcast a video showing traders buying and selling migrants from west africa for a few hundred dollars in a libyan marketplace the outcry was swift and global thousands of protesters marched against modern day slavery across africa and europe while the u.n secretary general said he was horrified he is part of the video that provoked international outrage. A man addressing an unseen crowd. Big strong boys for farm work, he says. 400. 700. 700. 800. The numbers roll in. These men are sold for 1,200 Libyan pounds, $400 a piece. You are watching an auction of human beings. Another man claiming to be a buyer. Off camera, someone asks, what happened to the ones from Niger? Sold off, he's told. CNN was sent this footage by contact. After months of working, we were able to verify the authenticity of what you see here. We decided to travel to Libya to try and see for ourselves. We're now in Tripoli, and we're starting to get a little bit more of a sense of how this all works. Our contacts are telling us that there are one to two of these auctions every month, and that there is one happening in the next few hours. So we're going to head out of town and see if we can get some sort of access to it. For the safety of our contacts, we have agreed not to divulge the location of this auction, but the town we're driving to isn't the only one. Night falls. We travel through nondescript suburban neighborhoods, pretending to look for a missing person. Eventually, we stop outside a house like any other. Adjust our secret cameras. Okay, so in a few minutes, we'll get the response from Rwanda. Um, they're offering to help um, to fix this problem. So before we get to my guests, it's also important to mention that we've gotten several reactions from world leaders. The first reaction came from Leonard Doyle he, from the International Organization for Migration. I'm hoping that can be on your screen any moment from now. And he says uh, modern-day slavery is widespread around the world and Libya is by no means unique. But what is particularly shocking is that this is happening effectively in the open where people can go to a farmhouse place and bid and end up owning a human being. He's not the only one who is really not happy about what's happening in Libya. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, says slavery has no place in our world and these actions are among the most egregious abuses of human rights and may amount to crimes against humanity. So those are some of the reactions that we've gotten from world leaders. And we've also um, had a little bit from African Union and, and African leaders as well just talking out against this. So let me start this conversation. Like I mentioned, let me reintroduce my guests. We have Ken Roth, who's executive director of Human Rights Watch. He's joining us via Skype. He's in Geneva. We have Ms. Simone Dege, um, UN Refugee Agency spokesperson. She's based here in Kenya. And we also have George Musse from Fragoman Immigration. Thank you so much um, to you all for creating time for speaking to us on Bottom Line Africa. Um, let me begin with you, Mr. Ken Broth. Your reaction to that report that was done by CNN and, and the realization that the world is actually coming to the realization that this is actually happening in Libya. 
Michael, I'm glad that CNN was able to get that too, because what it shows is just a tiny part of the nightmarish conditions that exist in Libya today. And slavery is just one aspect of that. What we find is that, you know, migrants or, or asylum seekers, refugees, they come to Libya for various reasons, and they get caught up in this, um, this outrage of human trafficking. Um, they're detained in horrible conditions. Um, the first thing that the traffickers do is try to extort funds from the family back home. So they'll put the person on the phone and say, you know, they're torturing me. Help, you got to send more money. And, and they'll get as much money as they can from the family. And when, when that's done, they then will start basically selling the person. You get women who are sold into sexual slavery. You get men who are sold into you know, other forms of, of, of physical labor as slavery. All of this is with routine, absolutely brutal treatment. Um, we, we, I think, are all have been reading about the people who have lost their lives at sea as they try to cross the Mediterranean to Europe. But what the International Organization on Migration, IOM, recently disclosed is that actually more migrants are dying as they cross Libya than are dying trying to cross the Mediterranean. Things are that bad. And so, um, you know, yes, we should all be outraged, but what we really need is for intense pressure to be put on these traffickers and on the Libyan government to stop this horror. And it's not just the slavery, as I say, it's, it's every aspect of severe mistreatment that these migrants are undergoing. All right, let me bring in uh, Ms. Ndege into this conversation. Uh, Ms. Ndege, you work for the UNHCR, and you're the spokesperson. So first of all, there are certain things I want you to clear up for me, um, because there's a little bit of confusion. Are they refugees? Are they migrants? And two, uh, Mr. Rotha spoke about some of the reasons why the, these individuals find themselves in countries like Libya. Could you expound a little bit on that? Um, and probably take me through what UNHCR is doing now that this report is out. UNHCR are absolutely shocked, Linda, at the images that we've been seeing on our TV screens and on social media. I watched the CNN report and I felt awful about the images of slavery that we saw. And there's no question that refugees are caught up um, in this human trafficking, this selling of human beings that's been going on um, in Libya. Uh, we have been calling on the Libyan authorities and we know that they've said that they're going to investigate um, what's going on. And we are very concerned that refugees are being exposed to, uh, to torture, uh, to sexual crimes, uh, to trafficking, um, to other forms of torture and abuse. And it's of huge concern to the UN Refugee Agency. Now, what we've been trying to do um, in Libya is to give refugees um, and migrants who we're very concerned about too, uh, the necessary protections that they deserve. Now, what does that mean in practical terms? It means, number one, access uh, to refugee communities, which is a huge problem um, in Libya. We know that there are at least 17,000 a mixture of refugees and migrants in detention centers um, in Libya. Uh, we recently managed to evacuate some of them uh, from Libya. Access is a problem because of the security situation. The South is, is practically cut off, so it's very difficult to actually uh, provide uh, the protection uh, services that many of these people who have been caught up um, in this terrible trade that we've been uh, seeing, again, as I say, on the TV screens and on social media. It's been extremely difficult to access them, but UNHCR is doing all it can to scale up operations and uh, calling for a comprehensive response that includes not just uh, the transit country, which in this case is Libya, but the countries that these individuals are coming from, uh, the Nigerias, uh, the Malis, the Niger Republic, um, other parts of West Africa, the transit country Libya, and where they're trying to get to, obviously, which for many of them um, is Europe. And refugees find themselves in these situations because they cannot find legal means um, to uh, leave their homes and, and go to the countries that uh, they want to seek asylum in, they end up in this sort of terrible, unbelievable, incredible exploitation. Okay, so let's start from where the problem is, Libya, as we move through the transit uh, routes and the countries where uh, these individuals come from. And, and George, this is where you come into this conversation. Um, there is the argument that 
what we're witnessing in Libya as we speak is because of uh, the security and financial collapse in Libya. Um, and, and that is why human trafficking and smuggling have become a booming trade. Um, what are your thoughts? You, Linda, I think the starting point for me is to join those that are condemning these horrific happenings in Libya. And secondly, important to note is Libya is not the source. Lib Libya is just you know, part of the transit point. This is a larger problem affecting the whole of Africa. Because these people, if you look at majority of them are not, I mean, they are not Libyans. They are people from around, the, around Africa. So that means the, the business of human trafficking and, and smuggling has been going on for a long time. And I think now because of the, a lot of uh, restrictions that have been put by the European Union in terms of people crossing over to Europe, and then they end up in Libya and in Niger. And what people need to realize is these people are, the, the, the initial intention is for them to go to Europe. And the smugglers take them to that place and they're not able to go. And these people need to recoup their money. So they resort to any form of um, activity that can see them getting back their money. And worst thing is they're even calling people back home. So. At the end of the day, this, is, this shows that there's a general failure in terms of governance in Africa, in terms of how we, we treat our citizens. Because again, the, the fundamental question we need to answer, to ask and get an answer is, why are people leaving their countries to risk everything that they have and they have known to end up the way we think them, 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 them you know, being sold into, into slavery? Mm -hmm. And important to also say is, this is the worst kind of human right violation you can have in the world. Yeah. If you look at um, Article 4 of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, it talks about you know, no person should be enslaved, no person should enslave another one. Even if you look at the Kenyan law, if you look at Article 25 and Article 30 in particular, it talks about we need to be free from uh, slavery, servitude, and forced labor. So it is horrific, and we must examine our conscience as a continent. Um, yes, there's a problem in Libya, as we all know. Uh, since the death of uh, Muammar Gaddafi, I mean, Libya has not had a unitary government. I mean, mm. there are factions. And for that reason, it becomes very difficult even to, to get hold of someone who is responsible and put them to task in terms of to stop this kind of servitude. So I think that's what I would say for, for a start. Okay, so I'm hoping a, a good number of my viewers have been able to watch part of that report by um, CNN's Nima Elberger. And because of time, we now need to look at how then do we move this forward? Um, because your individuals who are in um, positions to actually make a difference here. Uh, so, Mr. Roth, I'll begin with you. Um, do you think that probably if we have proper registration process, um, that would probably make a difference to the refugees and the immigrants that are in Libya? Is that a good starting point? Mr. Roth, can you hear me? Can I'm we? sorry. Um, please. Okay, so please. listen, we're trying to look at uh, solutions. How do we um, address what is currently happening in Libya? And there have been uh, suggestions that maybe, um, as the entire world, uh, there needs to be proper registration process for tens of thousands of refugees arriving in Libya. And, and there's also been the suggestion that probably we need to have and create opportunities for legal migration. Would that be a good place to start? So that would certainly be a good place to start. I mean, I think there are a number of things that we have to look at to try to address this problem. I mean, first of all, I mean, as a number of the speakers have said, that people coming to Libya are coming for a variety of reasons. You know, some of them are coming because of poverty. Some of them are coming because of persecution. Um, I think one message that has to get out is that regardless of how bad things are back at home, they are worse in Libya. You do not want to go to Libya as a migrant. Um, it's going to be all downhill. So that is a message that should get out. Um, second, obviously, we need to do more to address, nonetheless, the root causes of this flight. So that's going to require, you know, investment in economic development. It's going to require addressing the sources of violence and repression that leads to, to refugees fleeing. Then the question comes up, what do you do about the people who are already in Libya?
Now, so there know, has been some effort by the UN Refugee Agency and by the International Organization of Migration to try to move some of the people from Libya elsewhere to where it's safer. And so, you know, by all means, anything like that, where there can be a, um, the, where you can get people out of these nightmarish conditions is worth doing. Um, you certainly want to make it possible for people who need to seek asylum to find a way to have their claim heard without having to risk their lives going to Libya. So setting up lawful avenues in safer places, not in Libya, but in other countries, is completely worth doing. And then the final thing it's worth looking at is, you know, some of these people do pay the smugglers to get on boats for Europe. And, you know, and, and, and what is, what's happening is the, the conditions in Libya are so horrible that European governments know that it would be illegal for them to send anybody back to Libya. So once somebody gets on a European boat, they get brought to Italy, and then they get their claims for asylum processed and the like. But what Italy and the European Union are doing right now is because they cannot directly send people back to Libya within the law, they're trying to you know, play fast and loose. And they are training and paying and guiding the Libyan Coast Guard to keep these migrants in Libya. So they're basically doing indirectly what they can't do directly. And they're getting the Libyan Coast Guard to serve as their surrogate. They're paying them enough money so that they're keeping people in this hellhole of, of Libyan migration detention. And that is wrong. Um, you know, you can debate whether it's as blatantly illegal as sending somebody back, but it's basically doing indirectly what you're not allowed to do directly. Nobody's fooled by this. And I think it's urgent for the European Union as a matter of basic humanity to um, stop pushing people back, which in essence is what they're doing via the Libyan Coast Guard. Wow. Okay. So the individuals are actually doing this deliberately. Yvonne Degger, your reaction to what Rosa said? I mean, there are people who are training the Coast Guards to just keep these people around Libya. Listen to, to what Ken said, and I agree with much of what he said. One of the key issues that obviously needs to be addressed is what are the root causes of these crises, these huge waves of movement that we're seeing in this region. Why are people uh, leaving? They're leaving mainly because of instability, um, a lack of peace, war, um, civil strife in their countries, and feeling like trying to get to uh, places like Europe through these migration routes, through these transit routes, is the only way to escape suffering back home. And they're not able to use the legal means, obviously, uh, to get to these places. And when they get to places like Libya, mm. because they don't have the legal protection, um, they're subject to, and um, you know, they, they face the kind of exploitation um, that we have seen in this, the, these images that have come out um, on CNN. Um, what we are focusing on, as I said uh, slightly earlier, is trying to now set up mechanisms okay, within Libya to try and access those people, to give them the necessary protections that they need. Many of the people caught up in this are women. Many of them are minors. We know that in, in the last year alone, 2017, at least 15,000 um, unaccompanied minors from this region, from the Libya um, area and the surrounding countries have crossed over into Europe through the Mediterranean Sea and are basically on their own and, and are basically stranded. Mm. Okay, it's, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that you're trying to access these people. And we've had reports of some of uh, the refugees, some of the migrants still being held um, by the traffickers. Um, is there anything being done to secure their release in Libya? Because that is where now, that is the reason why we're even where we are. Because I listened to some of, of those who managed to escape and they're saying, listen, they put us in camps and when the camps are full to the brim, they sell us um, for as little as $400. And that also happens when we can't pay our debt. Well, that's right. I mean, earlier this month, the UN Refugee Agency thankfully was able to evacuate a number of refugees from Libya uh, to the Niger Republic. But obviously, this is not a long-term solution. What we need, number one, is access to the refugees to ensure that they're given the basic and, and necessary protections and rights, that their human rights um, are not abused or infringed in any way. But we've also called upon, the UN Refugee Agency have also called upon the international community to 
share the burden. And, 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 and this is really one of the key solutions to stopping um, the kind of exploitation, gross exploitation that we have seen in these images, um, giving the opportunity for uh, the tens of thousands of refugees out there who are seeking refuge and asylum in other countries, the opportunity to be resettled um, in third countries. Another important aspect to all of this is, you know, so much of the responsibility um, for this uh, humanitarian crisis, which is what, what it is that we're seeing, falls on just a few nations, a few nations such as Italy, which has received the bulk of uh, refugees um, coming from uh, the Libya region. Um, and what we are saying is that actually the international community needs to share this burden. Most of the countries that are uh, facing the, these problems around migrants, around refugees, are some of the poorest countries um, in the world. And it's about time that, uh, as we move forward, mm. uh, we look at a more comprehensive approach that shares the burden, that shares the responsibility of the displaced communities. Many of them have had to leave their homes, again, for no fault of their own. OK, so as you look at the comprehensive approach, um, and of course, focusing on long-term solution. George, um, Rwanda is offering um, refuge to enslaved African migrants trapped in Libya, of course, after that story that was done by CNN. Um, that is a good starting point, I, I may say. But short-term solution, long-term solutions from where you sit, what are they? Um, get you by Rwanda. But I mean, it can't be enough. Rwanda is, is a tiny country. And I have to say, the problem is larger than Rwanda, is larger than Libya, is larger than Niger and, and Italy. Because we need to address first, we need to stop the source of these people by addressing you know, uh, the root. Because these people are being smuggled. We need to stop the, smugg the smuggling syndicate. And number two, we need to identify all the people now stranded in Libya and probably the nationalities where they come from. And number three, try to see how best, because the way it is, it appears that a lot of them are in illegal detention, in, in illegal holding facilities. The first uh, intervention for me would be, we identify these people, put them in, in the hands of government that is recognized, even if it is government of Libya holding facilities where we can then push the government of Libya through diplomatic channels to make sure that these people are treated like human beings, getting basic, you know, provisions. Then after that, we need to identify countries that they come from. Say, for instance, there are Kenyans there, for instance, assuming there are, there are some. Mm. Then we need so to... Most of them come from Nigeria, Eritrea, Guinea, Ivory Coast, Gambia, Senegal, yes. Sudan, and Somalia. Just giving an example. Say, for instance, the Nigerians there, then the government of Nigeria can be requested, of course, to take responsibility and take back their citizens because for us to demand that uh, Europe opens their borders well is a good thing if possible. But then again, you know, there is only so much they can do. And then to say... But George, George, allow me to just interject. So if you ask governments to take back their people, that is a short-term solution. And you're not going to stop the rest of the people from just making this a similar trip again. I did say that we need to identify, because like I said, Linda, the problem is these people are being trafficked and smuggled by, by some syndicate, right? Um, so we need to, to cut those kind of cartels that are doing that so that we will reduce the numbers already going there. But obviously we need to address this within the larger context of making it possible for people that are in, in dire need, probably suffering from their countries, through the agencies that exist, IOM, UNHCR and other agencies, even African Union, to help them get a safer landing in countries where they feel they are comfortable. But like I said again, this is a larger problem that, that will require a lot of intervention from all stakeholders around the world. Mr. Kenroth, listening in to George, does that um, give you some sort of comfort? Is that a good place to start um, in terms of sorting um, the issue of the slave trade that we're witnessing in Libya? And while you're addressing that, please tell me your opinion on how the international community can stop the smuggling syndicate because those are the middlemen that actually get the men and women into the positions that they are right now. Well, you know, Linda, I would distinguish between smuggling and trafficking. I think people tend to use those two words as if they mean the same smuggling thing. Smuggling and but trafficking, they don't. okay. Yes, in other words, smuggling is what somebody does to go from one country to another when it's not easy to do that, you know, when they don't have a visa, when, when the, the 
and the destination country you won't let them in. And you have to resort to smuggling. But, you know, a smuggler is really just, in a sense, a low-class air company or train company or bus company. You know, they're, they, they, they move people from here to there for a fee, and it's all voluntary. So while it may be illegal in the sense that people are crossing borders without permission, um, it's not violent. It's voluntary. Trafficking is completely different. Trafficking is when um, basically smuggling takes on a violent dimension. And traffickers are holding people coercively. They are forcing them to do things. Um, they typically force them to pay. They may force them into sexual servitude. They may force them into other forms of slavery. Um, trafficking is, is, um, you know, is itself a crime. And so I, I would distinguish the two. I mean, I, I am not in favor of stopping smuggling. I think people should be able to move. Um, you're better off addressing the, the reasons that they want to move. So address the poverty, you know, invest in economic development, address the wars, try to stop them, address the persecution. You know, those are all things that are worth stopping so that people are not pushed to flee. But if they want to flee, you know, smuggling is often all that they can do. But we do have to attack traffickers okay. because when people use violence to try to exploit desperate people, because people on the move are very vulnerable to exploitation, and if traffickers use violence to take advantage of those people, that is a very serious crime, and that indeed does have to be stopped. Okay. All right, so George Yvonne, I'll let you have the final word, don't worry. So George, the EU and African Union um, are having a summit today and the leaders are talking about several issues, including that story um, by CNN um, on the slave trade in Libya. Short-term measures for African leaders specifically, George, what are your thoughts? Thank you, Linda. I think the problem we are facing today is the one of failure on leadership in Africa. Even the problem we are facing in terms of people being, you know, sold into slavery in Libya is part of the same problem. You know, Libya is in turmoil. So for me, I think African leaders need to take responsibility and institute reforms in their countries in terms of governance, economic development, and any other mechanism they must use to make sure that they, they, they address the, the factors that push people to, to run away from their, their, their countries. And secondly, in the meantime, they need to, we need to have leaders like, you know, the President Kagame has done in terms of accepting to take some of these people. Yeah. Because we should not look at the West for solutions uh, for African problems. And that, I think that is the statement that President Kagame is sending. And we also need to, I mean, look at the President yesterday, uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta, saying that Africans should be allowed to travel within Africa easily. So that, say for instance, some of those people that are in Libya would wish to travel to Kenya for some reason, they could do that. Yeah. So on the overall, in the meantime, they need to look at ways of accommodating some of these people that are, are stuck in Libya. But on the long term, they need to address real issues of governance and econo socio-economic challenges facing uh, African continent. Ms. Yvonne Dege, you get the final word um, on this show. So George says African problems should be resolved by African leaders. Um, finally, as we wrap this program up, from where you sit, um, what is the one thing right now that the world should be focusing on with that story from Libya now? Well, well unfortunately, Linda, there is no quick fix. We do need a comprehensive approach to this. Uh, much of the solutions are political solutions. Uh, people are fleeing instability, they are fleeing war, and they won't go home and they will continue to flee until there are political solutions to the various crises in the countries where many of these uh, refugees and migrants are coming from. So that's number one. Mm. Also, funding for much of the programs that we run is also required. Only 14% of the programs that we require and services we want to give to refugees are actually funded in Africa. That's another uh, huge uh, issue that needs to be looked at so that we can provide the basics, which are registration of refugees, making sure uh, that people are protected, making sure that people have the right to asylum, making sure that they're not exploited um, along the way, as we've seen in the CNN um, exclusive on slavery um, in Libya. So these are just some of the things that really need to be looked at. And again, as I said earlier, 
uh, collective responsibility, collective responsibility not just um, in Africa where these uh, individuals are emanating from, but the countries of transit like Libya, which is just one of many, and the receiving countries or the countries where they hope to get to. Okay. All of these countries need to really come to the table and come up with a comprehensive um, solution to sorting uh, this crisis out. But okay. until there is stability in many of the home countries where these people are coming from, many will continue to flee. All right. That would be a good place to end this conversation. Trust me, we, uh, this is just the beginning because this is a conversation that the whole world really must have. African leaders really must have. And like I mentioned, African Union leaders were meeting today and um, the, Africa, the AU chairman, Musa Faki, has appealed to heads of state in Africa to repatriate the migrants. Is that going to be a solution? Um, let's wait and see. So allow me to say a big thank you to my guests tonight on Bottom Line Africa. We had Ken Roth, executive director of Human Rights Watch is, was joining us from Geneva. He's actually joining us from Geneva. Thank you so much for your time. We had Ms. Yvonne Dege, UN Refugee Agency spokesperson. Um, thank you as well as George Musse from Fragoman Immigration. You have really made this conversation worthwhile and we thank you um, for being part of Bottom Line this evening. So, on the bottom line tonight, that... Uh, I'll get you the bottom line in a bit, but let's take a look at the proverb, proverb of the day. I mean, we're Africans, lots of our grandmothers used to tell us lots of proverbs. Could we take a look at today's proverb before we look at the bottom line? So our focus tonight has been the slave trade that is currently happening in Libya that has raised quite an uproar. So on the bottom line tonight, that the world could wait for the media to do an expose on the abhorrible modern day sale of illegal immigrants as slaves to invoke passionable response is somewhat hypocritical, for lack of a better word. Tonight, two, for 242 of those migrants have been processed and repatriated back to their home country in Nigeria from Libya. Ivory Coast, too, has repatriated some of their citizens. What about the others? The bottom line is this are fellow Africans whose only crime is to seek a better life for themselves away from home. Naturally, it should move the nerve of any rational thinking African that it is time the continent address the root cause of the crisis. The president of Mali, Burkina Faso and Niger all summoned the Libyan ambassadors resident in their countries, while French President Manuel Macron called for an emergency security council meeting, saying the slave trade in Libya was, quote, crime against humanity. The public outcries of indignation should therefore be more solution-oriented out of anger directed at what I can only describe as gross human rights violations and extreme abuse and mishandling of detainees, including sexual abuse, slavery, forced prostitution, torture, and maltreatment. As African leaders, together with their European counterparts, dine and wine in the Ivorian capital of Abidjan, we can only hold on to hope that tangible resolutions aimed at securing the social and political capital of the African youth will be arrived at. And that is the bottom line. So that is where we wrap up our show tonight. Thank you so much for watching. Um, it has been a good conversation, but a very sad one at that. I'm Linda Ogutu. Have a good night. <laughs>